Well, hi, everybody, and I want to say thank you for joining us today and to learn more about lean and effective design research. Um, and I'm excited to see everybody come in and after lunch be somewhat prompt. I want to go ahead and get started so that uh, we have plenty of time for questions at the end. But when we talk about research in the terms of business, we have two ends of the spectrum. We have one end of the spectrum where we'll take upwards to a year to understand certain uh, business opportunities we have. So that'll be a lot of strategy and looking at what is the landscape and trends that people are, are doing and how do we understand the business opportunities we have. On the other end of the spectrum, we have about one week of doing research. And it's really asking one question in a particular project and how are we going to get that done. Um, in this particular talk, what we'll be looking at is a four to six week timeline and we're trying to understand uh, pro information around uh, a certain project that we're doing or a certain product. So we'll be looking at how do we understand our users, what are our stakeholders' visions, and how do we synthesize all that information to disperse those ideas out to the team. And I don't know if you guys had a chance to go to some of the other talks yesterday, but uh, yesterday I attended Peter's talk about designing orgs for design orgs. And what I thought uh, he said in there, he had a certain slide that was really relevant to this. And he had a slide that showed not only his team had different skill sets, but they also had different levels of design information. And so at the top level, there was this thousand foot view of strategy. Then there was a design lead underneath that that was able to pull out that big picture. And then they were able to disperse that information out to their team. And then below that, they had some more executioner level type people. And so a lot of the activities I have in this particular uh, slide deck will be talking about that design lead, about how do I understand the big picture and make sure we're all on the same page of that big picture, and then how do I synthesize that information so that the team can do that effectively and execute on, on the way they need to. So before we get into the methodologies, I want to tell you guys a little bit about the company I work for, Dialexa, and who I am so you know what point of reference we're talking about. So Dialexa is my company and we're, we design products end to end. We did make sure that we design products that customers actually want to use and we also make sure that we address the business outcomes of the product we're designing for because if we don't create value for users then our business has no revenue or no purpose and then if we don't make sure that the business needs are addressed then we can't create value for our users because we don't have a business that's sustainable. So we try to make sure that we understand both sides of and balance both those needs in order to execute a great product. Um, we do client services, so we are end-to-end -end product execution. These are some of the things that we offer. We like to package them all together because that provides a cohesive uh, product, but um, we can slice and dice it in any sort of way. And Dialexa not only talks the talk, they also walk the walk. And so we have a Dialexa Labs division where our uh, internal employees can pitch ideas and be able to uh, vet those ideas out and see if there's a viable company and a viable product. And then we work after hours, blood, sweat, and tears, and we produce a company that we then can uh, spit out. And we have two of those companies that are successful. One is Venly, that is a connected car platform. And the other is Robin. Oops. It's an on-demand lawn care service. And so these are both things that we have internally vetted out, gone to market, done the research, done all the design hardware, and put it out there, and they're out there successfully. So a little bit about me. I'm Sarah Reed. Nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm the senior UX and design researcher at Dialexa. And so what I do is um, when we kick off a new project with our clients, I'll uh, start with our discovery process. And we, when I started at Dialexa, our discovery process was very minimal about how do we get the business requirements and what are some of the things that they can expect from us. And as uh, we continue to grow, we wanted to make sure that we asked more questions about why are we doing what we're doing because we want to be a partner with our clients. And so we ended up growing our strategy session into this four to six week stretch uh, discovery as, as a four to six week strategy session um, in order to better understand our project and why we were doing what we're doing, who are our users. This really helped our design and development, but we also found that it not only helped us, 
but it helped our, our stakeholders and clients as well because they ended up learning from each other and learning from us and being able to think things through and be able to, we gave them the tools they needed to be able to sell their ideas within their own company and articulate why they're creating value, why this product had purpose. And so we found that these kind of activities are not only helpful for us to be able to design and build a product, but it's also helpful for our stakeholders to be able to say, this is why this matters and this is why we're doing it. And it helped them have alignment between themselves as well. Getting them all in a room is challenging, but it's definitely very powerful for them to have conversations together. Um, let's talk a little bit, refer briefly, about the history of design research, if you guys aren't familiar. The term design research actually started out as meaning researchers are studying design processes and trying to understand what that's all about. And then over time, what happened is designers actually flipped the word or flipped the meaning and they were able to understand research practices and use them to enhance their design practice. So now when we talk about design research, we're often talking about how do designers take some research methodologies and adopt it in their design practice. Um, one of these things that's clearly seen is an ethnography. Ethnography in a research sense is for us to study and understand humans and their quote unquote natural habitat. And a design finds this very useful because it gives them the full dimension of the user. They're not only understanding what the user says they do, but they can actually see what they actually do. Because um, as we've all seen, people say one thing and do another. In fact, if you went to Steve's talk yesterday, he gave some stats about people saying, oh, I'm, I drive safely, I'm not distracted, but I can multitask and driving while being distracted is a huge problem. Well, if everybody's driving safely, then there's some disconnect on what they're saying and what they, they, they actually do. And so ethnography helps uh, uncover some of those assumptions on what people say they do and, and what they actually do. It's been really powerful in industrial design. That's where it first uh, got it incorporated to. And uh, companies that started using it in industrial design, they found that during the Great Depression, those companies actually thrived better because they built better products that withstand longer during times of recession. And so we've started adopting this in screen design and um, it's been very helpful in a way of understanding how our design impacts people. The next thing I want to talk about is design thinking. And it's a term that started uh, surfacing in the 60s, but it wasn't until the 90s where it started crystallizing its idea of creative action, a method of creative action. And then IDEO brought it into the business as a way to understand consumer insights and rapid prototyping to get beyond our assumptions that block effective solutions. And so they're really big about how do we get beyond what we think we know to what is actually a reality. And that's what I see with a lot of these design research methods is I want to be able to see how I can quickly as possible get beyond our assumptions, figure out what we know and what we don't know, and how can we bridge that gap so that we can design a better product for, um, for our users and that'll be more effective for our company. And there's two trends that I'm seeing now with research and with uh, the way we're building technology products. And one of those is we first talked about agile methodology as a way of engineering, and then we saw design practice uh, develop agile methodologies within engineering, and we saw UX adopt usability and how they were able to adopt their practice and keep that within the methodology, and now I'm starting to see ways in which we can take research practices and try to make sure we use an agile way of understanding how it affects our products. Because while it would be great for us to spend a lot of time researching, finding a lot of information and sifting through it, we just don't have the luxury of doing that. So how can we take these practices and incorporate them in our day-to-day -day routine that we're already doing? The second thing I've seen is that um, uh, companies have really started adopting design as a way of competitive advantage and that we've now no longer I feel like have to fight for design being a part of the, the product and being part of something that's valuable in the company that uh, there's a lot more acceptance to that at least in the conversations I'm hearing and the next step I'm seeing is well if we all have design and we're all competitive that way what's the next way that 
we can make the next competitive product. And what I'm seeing is a trend towards understanding research and understanding your users and your market as getting you a competitive edge. And that's one thing, um, I've been reading this book called Play Bigger, and it's all about how these, so studying all these startups and how they've been able to basically create themselves as a category king. And how do you do research to make yourselves a quote unquote category king? And some of these examples are Uber is the category king of on demand uh, ride sharing. And they're basically, once you've crowned yourself as category king, you can actually stay dominant in that particular area. And it's really hard to overcome that particular. Uh, organization because it's so bedded in everybody's uh, mindset. Uh, a more traditional example of this that you guys may not be familiar with is bird's eye uh, freezing. They actually, uh, are the, if you buy frozen foods, it's probably from them, and they're ones that actually created this market. Frozen food didn't bolt, uh, wasn't there before, and so they created the whole industry of being able to flash freeze and created the whole process and then also marketed it to where people feel like that's comfortable and that's acceptable. And so they did all the strategy legwork to understand basically how they could be the, the owner undominated of frozen food. And that's pretty much still true today that they're the category king of that. And so we're looking at ways in which we can use research and findings to make sure that our products stay on top and are successful throughout a long length of time. Now, before we get into talking about the particulars of the methodologies, I want to talk about some of the supplies that will really be helpful to running a smooth sessions. The first thing that I find crucial to bring to my uh, workshop meetings is this time timer. And the time timer does sound like it's made for kids, and that's because it is. It was designed to help kids understand the abstract concept of time. And so it does so with that, uh, let me, does that work? No, I can do it over here. This little guy. <laughs> anyway, the, the thing that the guy is holding is a time timer and it has a red disc that you can uh, basically adjust and so you get a visual of how much time is left. And then once the, the red disc is gone, there's a soft beeping. And what I've used this for is it helps me make sure I stay on time with my workshops and my meetings. There has been a time where I ran an all-day workshop to do some of these methods, and I just kept pushing everybody to get one thing done, and I thought we could do it quickly. And then it ended up, we totally worked through what lunch till two o'clock, and I made everybody miss the food trucks. There were some people a little <laughs> aggravated with me. And so it was all fine because they, prepared them that I was like a, a mean person, so get prepared. And so I already had this persona off, and so it just fit into the persona they gave me. But um, Because it was the idea of, if you don't get this done, I'll make you miss lunch. Um, but the, the time timer helps to make sure that you guys stay on time, that you guys are hitting your agenda. And it also helps, uh, the psychology of it is really interesting, and how it helps people just be okay with moving on to the next thing and stop talking. Um, because there was a time, too, where I was having everybody write some uh, information out on post-it notes and think creative, independently on some things they uh, wanted to answer. And I thought, well, this won't take a long time. I'll just set the time timer to five minutes. They'll watch it go out, and I can say, hey, everybody, time's up, and you can stick your stuff on the, on the, post, on the wall. And what ended up happening is even though when the time was up and it was only five minutes, and I said, hey, guys, time's done, everybody still was continuing to work. And instead of me yelling at them to like, hey, everybody be done, what I did is I just pulled the time timer back one minute, turned the alarm on, and then when that beep went off, everybody just like stood up like lemmings and was able to, to put it on the wall. So it's really effective way for you to cut people off without having to be rude. If that's a problem for you, it's a problem for me. Um, but it also makes sure that you keep your meetings run on time. The other thing that's been really useful for us are these full stick post-it notes. Um, we've used, we were first using just regular colored post-it notes, and the problem was that because we were sticking them on the wall and rearranging them, some of them would start falling off the wall. And while I was talking and we were uh, discussing the stuff on the wall, I'd find myself like trying to quickly uh, grab it and put it back on the wall. And while I impressed some people with how fast my reaction time was, 
overall, it was very annoying to try to keep up with, we actually prioritized this in a certain way, and now I don't know where it went because it fell off the wall. So these full stick post-it notes really help make sure that wherever we placed information and we put it in a certain area, it, it stayed on the wall. And then they also come in three different colors. I would say at least have three different colors because that helps you segment information and then see them uh, in their categories. The other thing we found extremely useful are fine point dry erase markers because they're small enough you can write on the post-it notes with. They're large enough that if you do a sketch session, nobody's caught up in the details because the marker's too big to get into details. Um, they also allow you to write on the whiteboard, so nobody's worried about Sharpies being on the whiteboard, so they're very great for a multitude of activities. And then uh, the last supplies is voting stickers are very useful. I strongly believe in these workshop settings, having us come up with answers and ideas independently, and even making decisions independently, but then um, being able to have conversations together. So we benefit from everybody's ideas, but we're not uh, having the loudest person uh, overtake the particular conversation. It's everybody can contribute. Um, and with these voting stickers, if there's something like an idea that we have to make a decision on, they help outline what are some things that people really like. If you have a decision maker, like they have to decide on a particular product direction, they get extra stickers. They get super stickers because in real life, they're what they say counts more because that's the direction we'll probably end up going even if we all decide on something else. So it's really important to reflect that in the voting process, they get extra um, votes. <coughs> and then the last thing that's not uh, particularly supplies, but it's, I find it's really important to feed people and make sure they have food and drink. And so, uh, and the other thing is also, I find that snacks that are lighter are better, so I love bringing banana chips and it just helps people stay informed. Like the time when I made everybody uh, miss lunch, at least we had snacks, so everybody was participating and contributing, so that, that was really crucial and, and helpful. So now let's talk about the tools and methods we use that we find really effective. And um, these particular methods that I'm gonna start out with are what we use during our discovery phase. So this is when we're trying to understand the business, understand the project, and understand the users before we start designing and developing. And in all these particular workshops that I have, we have our stakeholders, we have our design leads, we have our engineering leads, and we have our project managers. So everybody's benefiting from understanding this information. So the first thing may be obvious to you guys, but I find it extremely crucial, and that is talk to your stakeholders and talk to their customers. And the reason that I find uh, this so effective is because we really are the mediators between the vision that the stakeholders have and the weeds of what users are actually doing. And so they need someone to bridge that gap and understand what are the present day needs of the user and then what are the vision that we're trying to create and how do we meet the two in the middle. And what I find uh, highly effective is if you guys did have time to do ethnography, that would be great. Oftentimes we don't have enough time. We just spend a day or two interviewing as many people as we can. And so what I'll do to speed along the process is I'll go ahead and create an interview guide for each type of person, each role, to make sure that we have a full uh, discussion on everything that we know we need to get information about. And then we try to meet the customer in their particular environment and we record our session. This is helpful for us as we're taking notes, but it's also helpful for people that we're onboarding and have enough time to watch these videos because there's nothing more empathetic than watching somebody in their environment deal with the sort of programs and things that they're having to deal with. And so this is really helpful for us to get a full picture of what are the customer's pain points and needs. Um, now we're going to talk about uh, some of the activities we do with the stakeholders. Once, the other reason I like to do the interviews first thing is because it helps give me a base of understanding uh, what this business is, what they already know, who these customers are, and then we can participate in these next uh, few uh, types of Canvas and workshop activities because now I've seen some things and I actually can put input and bring some new information to the table. So the first thing I want to talk about is the business model Canvas and it is used to help explain and explore new business models. 
And this right here, there's a couple different layers to the business model. We'll be talking about the square in the middle. But you can also use these, those color blobs are ways to represent the idea of what's the landscape around the business model. So what are the industry trends? What are the socioeconomic trends? What are the technology trends? And um, if you want to do broader research strategy and understand where this business is going and what are our opportunities, I'd spend more time on those colored bubbles, doing competitive analysis, doing some, some market research to be able to answer those questions. Um, because that really helps set the stage of how, what's the landscape and how does your business fit in the particular uh, trends we're seeing now. So the business model has two sides to it. It has this uh, blue side that I have here, which is all about efficiency. So it's, we've got your key partners, key activities, key resources, and cost structure. And if you can look at this and identify this, this is everything that has to do with uh, the things that cost your business money. And if you can reduce something on this side, you can reduce cost. That's one way to save a business money. <coughs> on the other side, on the goldish side, is everything to do with the value of the business. So what are your value propositions? Who are your customers? How are you delivering your value proposition to those customers and what are your channels for interacting with them? And how much are they paying? And how are you getting actually money and value? So that the other side is, is all about the value of the business. So here, this might be a little small for you guys to see, um, but it's an example of a business model. And how I have this laid out here is the questions that uh, I try to have for people to uh, be able to write post-it notes out and be able to answer each one of these particular squares. And then below it, uh, it's a very faint blue, but that faint blue is an example of Amazon uh, and, and the way their business model works. And they actually uh, pivoted and changed and added on to their business model. So here in this light blue, what we have is their key partners when Amazon started out was their logistic partners. They had to build up IT infrastructure and fulfillment structure so they could deliver their online retail to customers who wanted online retail. And they did so by their Amazon.com website, by uh, their affiliates that they used, and they used uh, to enhance their customer relationship, they used a recommendation engine to recommend certain products and services. And then they got money for selling that online retail. They got some sales margin from that. Now when Amazon, as we laid this out, we can see that Amazon used their existing resources and their key activities, the, uh, the IT resources and their product fulfillment, as a way to enhance and grow another business model. So with their existing IT infrastructure, they were off able to offer a value proposition of Amazon Web Services to IT companies. And that actually gave them more sales margin, so they didn't have to reduce necessarily their cost or their structure, but they actually made more money from the activities that they were already doing by packaging that and selling it to customers. And then they also used the way that they were uh, enhancing fulfillment services as a way to sell that to companies who needed better fulfillment services. So that was another value proposition where they were able to look at what is our business already doing and how can we innovate on this and create more money for the business. Um, so Amazon is a category king and below this I have an example of a lesser known company. Do any of you guys, are any of you guys familiar with Cars to Go? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well then, maybe it was just me <laughs> who didn't know about them. But uh, what I wanted to put on Cars, the reason I wanted to use Cars to Go as an example here is that I see them as a similar, in a similar space as Uber, Lyft, and even Zipcar because they provide individual urban mobility without the need of a car ownership. But the way we can see when we lay this out that makes them different than Uber or Lyft is they partner with city management. So they have cars on city spaces, similar to like a bike share type of place. And what also makes them different is they have a fleet of smart cars. So their key activities and resources are managing those smart cars and being able to maintain those. And so that's one thing that based on just writing out this business model canvas, we can understand how they're similar and how they're different um, and what their business model is all about based on just being able to fill out these few squares in one slide. And this is why it's really powerful for companies like startups to be able to fill this out because they can use this one slide to clearly articulate what their business is about and have everybody on the same page. What I like about this um, and how I've used this is to be able to, one thing is, 
to be able to make sure I'm on alignment with understanding a company's business, and I've also used it as a way to build trust. So the way I've used it to build trust is um, to, basically when I did the, the customer interviews and the stakeholder interviews, I asked our stakeholders, what are some of the things that you're excited about this project? What are some goals and, and great things you see? And then I asked them, what are some of the things that make you nervous about this project that you think will make this project fail? And what are some of the risks? And the main answer they gave me on that was that you guys are new coming in and you don't understand our business. And the last company we hired spent six months trying to understand us and write user stories. And you guys are trying to do this in four weeks and we don't, we're not sure you guys know what you're doing. And so then I took that as a challenge, like, okay, you don't think I can understand and learn your company? I'll show you we can. Um, and so instead of just writing out this, this uh, canvas and showing it to them, what I did is I got us all in a room together. I got um, the stakeholders and the Dialexa leaders all together, and we filled out this form on Post-it Notes, and we put all our answers on the wall, and we saw where we had alignment and where we had misalignment. And what happened was we all had great team alignment. We can prove to this company that we actually understood their business by asking smarter questions and we were able to communicate the value that we understood. And so this was one thing that really won, won our trust with that client and I was really glad that that pulled off for them. And if, if there was misalignment, it would be a great place to make sure we're on the same page. I don't know if you guys have ever been in a particular situation where you guys are talking about a new venture or a new idea and what happens a lot of times, at least in my situations, is there's a guy on a whiteboard talking about his ideas, drawing all these crazy graphs, trying to communicate what his ideas are, but it's hard for us to participate because it's all what's in his head and the way he sees explaining it. And then when we walk away, everybody had a different idea of how this business model looked or how this innovation or product should be, and we are all uh, misaligned. So what I like about this particular application is we can all contribute to the conversation because it's all in a framework in which we have a shared language and understanding. And so when we're talking about a new business model or we're talking about a new venture, we can look at the, we can basically use these sort of tools and squares and make sure we're understanding the whole entire entirety of the business, making sure it connects the dots across the board, that we're not just creating revenue without connecting it to a customer and connecting it to a value proposition. And then we can make sure we have a full conversation about the, the whole thing. You can also use this as a way of innovation. There's a Business Model Canvas book that goes more into depth about how you can use this as a way to really do some exercises and have some customers uh, use it as a way of, of creating new business model strategies. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the value proposition canvas. It's uh, created by the same guy who did the business model canvas. These are not, you don't have to do these together. In fact, a lot of times I like using the value proposition canvas and, and do that solely because it's a way to understand how you're creating value for your customers without, uh, but with using business language. And I'll explain what I mean here in a sec. So, with the business model or value proposition canvas, you identify your different customer segments and you'll outline them in their jobs that they have, the pains associated with that job, and the gains. And then you'll be able to map out your uh, product that you're using and you'll be able to outline the features, how those create gains, and how those relieve pains. And so let's take a little deeper look into uh, a customer profile. Here I'll spend Every, I'll get it once again, everybody in the same room, and I'll have us spend five minutes writing out all the jobs that we think that particular customer profile has. And we'll all individually put that up, and then we'll stick it on, on the whiteboard after the five minutes, and then we'll have a 15 minute conversation prioritizing what do we think, if that person had to get that job done today, what's the mo most important thing, and then we'll start outlining the least important thing. The priority part is a really important key component to this activity because it, it helps you as a designer and developer know what's the most important things that we're solving for. Um, and it also helps us say, like instead of saying like, oh, everything's important, actually we need to make sure that we address the most important things or can we get more, uh, more of a low-hanging fruit and create value that way. Um, 
So in this particular example, if we had a CIO, we'd spend some time writing out ideas like how he's managing users, how he's communicating value for the company, um, and then also some of his pains might be his budget cuts or the fact that everybody has multiple uh, mobile devices and then his gains would be when everybody stays compliant and when uh, he has a seat on, on the table of the board. And so when we talk about this particular customer profile, we're not just talking about in the way of how does our, our product create value, but how who this person entirely is and what are some of the social gains that they have, what are some of the things that um, make them more uh, fleshed out as a human and how do we create value for them based on achieving maybe some of those social gains or maybe we can't do it. Like one example we had was that a really negative thing was negative social media and backlash from people and that was one thing our product couldn't solve for and we weren't going to try to figure out how to mitigate that risk. Um, but this prioritization, like I said, is, is a really useful tool and it really helps us be able to have that conversation and this is where stakeholders really learn from each other. And on this particular activity, um, we were able to have with one client say that they had learned more about their customers and about their business in these three days that we did these activities, more so than the, the six, I think it was what, six months, six weeks, six months? It was, yeah, <laughs> I first thought it was six weeks because I thought surely that was how long they spent, but it was six months of, of research. And I think one of the reasons why they learned more in this particular uh, use case was because everybody's contributing and everybody's having a conversation versus somebody individually figuring out information and then giving it to them in a slide deck. Like they had so many slide decks of information, but I think after a while it's really hard for us to digest like what's valuable in a 50 deck slide deck. Um, so once you go through the different customer profiles, here we did four, we'll then go through the, the product that we're building. And so we'll outline the features that this particular product has and how it creates gains and how it creates pains. Um, and one thing about this that I find a little tricky is how do we identify what's a gain creator and what's a pain reliever? Because sometimes they sound like they're very similar. And so one thing that we use to help as a benchmark is a pain reliever is something that uh, already exists, right? So if I have a problem with multiple meetings and I feel like I'm on meetings all the time and this tool is supposed to help eliminate a lot of meetings, then that's a pain reliever because that's something that has already existed that I have an issue with and we're relieving that pain. But again, creator might be giving you something new and something that wasn't there previously. So if the game creator helps me uh, appear more intelligent to my coworkers and seem like I'm on top of everything, then that would be more of a, a game creator than a, than a pain reliever. Unless, I guess I have the pain of sounding like an idiot, then that would, that would be a, an appropriate pain reliever. <laughs> um, another thing too that I wanna go back to and address about the jobs. Um, this is really easy when we do have talk about specific jobs. It gets a little trickier, this abstract concept of a job, when we're talking about entertainment services and things like uh, exercise and health, like other services that aren't necessarily geared towards a corporate environment. But you can use this as a way to think of, um, there's this idea that every, everything has a job, like a milkshake has a job, in the way that that milkshake might be the job to fill you and satisfy you, be a dessert treat, or um, and understanding what that job is is really effective to understand how that product, um, how your product basically you can enhance it. And what I mean by that is Burger King wanted to figure out how they could sell more milkshakes. They thought the milkshake's job was to be more of a dessert after treat, um, after dinner. And so they, they tried a couple iterations on how to make that better. And then when they did research, they found out that most people buying their milkshakes were actually buying them at breakfast time on their commute to work. So actually the job of the milkshake was more about like substituting coffee for people who didn't like coffee and entertaining them that way. And so once they figured out what that job was, they were able to change their product and gear towards certain people. And by outlining these jobs, there's another activity called user story mapping that basically takes people's jobs and you outline them and then you're able to say what are the tasks of all in those jobs. And once you outline those tasks to get those jobs done, um, it's a way to basically understand uh, ways that you can do user stories and sprints. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of, of that here in, in a bit. But uh, once you've outlined your value map, 
your pains and gains. You can actually uh, t compare them to your customer profile and see where they align. So you can actually now very quickly see this product is made for these pains and gains in these specific jobs, and this is a way in which we're creating value for this user because they're directly connected. Now, just like your spouse shouldn't be your everything, otherwise you're putting too much pressure on them and you need to have other friends and things in your life, um, your value map cannot be your customer segments, everything. Because if you're aligning everything that your value map is doing with your <coughs> customer segment, that probably means you don't know your customer enough because there should be some things you can't address, or it's not specific enough that it actually does anything useful. And so you need to make sure that when you're mapping things out that it seems somewhat realistic. And if it doesn't, then that's a way for a gut check for you guys to do more research or reevaluate your value map and your ideas and make sure you guys aren't getting carried away. Because sometimes I get carried away with like, this could solve for everything. And it turns out it, it should. Um, and so that's one thing. Uh, you can use this once again as an alignment tool for everybody to have conversation, make sure they understand the users, they understand how we're creating value. Um, you can also use it as an, as an ideation benchmark. So if you guys are, are thinking about different products that you want to solve for your customers and create, you guys can spend a, a workshop session coming up with sketches, coming up with ideas, pitching those ideas, then deciding on which one of those are the ones you want to proceed forward. And you can create this value map for, for, the, the, for those particular ideas and see which one might be creating value for the highest level of jobs or more jobs that it inc incorporates for and how those basically benchmark compared to each other. Um, the other thing I love about this is um, we had some clients who had a hard time articulating why this product was important. Like we knew after doing some of these sessions this, this product was important. And the value proposition canvas actually makes it really easy for you to be able to uh, say and why it's so important. And you basically take a job, you take a pain, and you uh, take a, a pain reliever and a gain creator and add some verbs, and you can say something like, Dialexa Engage helps project managers who want to improve client relationships by avoiding unproductive meetings and centralizing easy communication about the project in one place. And then if we were doing the full thing, it's like, unlike this other service or product. So that's another way that you can use this to quick, uh, quickly articulate how you guys are creating value. Now once we do all these uh, type of workshop activities, and once we've done a lot of research and we gathered all the information that we um, know is important to us about our project, I like to synthesize all that information in a journey map. And there was a great talk yesterday too about journey maps and which ones are effective and why and why not. And I agree with her thesis completely about if you're not creating it to explain something, like don't create a journey map, just to create it. Make sure that it's tailored to actually communicate some idea and has, has some purpose. So we definitely take liberty with adjusting our journey maps and tailoring them to the project that we're doing in order to make sure that we are communicating the ideas that we need to communicate about the research we did. And uh, this is an example of one of the journey maps we have created for our clients. What I like about it is um, basically I'm trying to get a visual representation of all the information that we're talking about. And usually what we do, and we don't present this in a digital way, we print it out and we put it on the board and we talk through it um, in a way that we can basically see the whole thing and get up and, and close with it. Because um, it pretty much encapsulates the whole project of what we're doing and why it's important. So this top blue bar is uh, basically the first thing is it's talking about the vision of the project. Where are we going to be in a year, in five years? Um, a lot of times stakeholders are really excited about the, the next couple steps, not the immediate step you're doing. And so this really helps make sure that we keep them engaged and that we understand where we're, the direction we're headed and uh, where north is. And then I really want to get specific and I want to talk about the next three months and what our objectives are so we don't get lost in what this grand vision is, but we're very specific on what is our MVP, what are, what are our uh, next steps and understanding that particular goal. And then based on the research we're doing, we're usually able to provide some guiding principles about our design and development. We've seen enough patterns and trends that we know these are the three key things that will make this project, uh, um, keep them on, on, on guidelines to keep this project uh, specific to what the needs we saw. And then we'll, we'll map out the 
a user's journey, and we'll do this based on how they interact with the product. So it's not like a personal narrative where we're talking about everything they go through their particular day. We're talking about really what are the processes that they do and where does our product that we're building uh, insert into those particular um, uh, those particular steps. It may be one of those steps along the way or it may be the whole entire process. We need to make sure our project um, it has or some kind of interaction with the users. And this is really helpful for us in understanding how what their current situation is and how can we improve on it. It also helps us understand if they're in the office or not in the office, what are they doing, where are they, where are they going, and what are the different processes and phases that, they're, that we're using this product in. And then below that, we've basically done some interviews. So we've got some ideas uh, about what are the most things, what are, what are we hearing about the most from these interviews, and what are some of those patterns we're seeing. And so we take those quotes and we put them on here so that we have an understanding of what the user's thinking. So we have a, the, the process up here, the dots, are about understanding what they're doing, and now we want to understand what they think and how they feel. And so we pull those quotes out there. And then below that, for this particular project, we wanted to understand basically how inefficient their process was today because they were using several different applications. So we actually counted up what each step they were doing in each particular process to understand what they had to do for one particular user. And so you'll see it goes up all over the board. And basically when our project, when we're done building our particular product for them, we should be able to draw a line that shows how efficient we've made it because we'll probably have a straight line at the bottom. Maybe a few ups and downs that we didn't account for, but we can uh, visually show how much uh, efficiency we've created by building this product. And that's kind of an example of the ROI that we've done by saving them so much time. And then below that is the uh, little gauges for um, understanding how many people are using them in this particular process, how often they're doing this process. So as you can see, almost all of these processes they're doing every day. And then um, how difficult are those processes? So that kind of helps give us a target for what are the most um, inefficiencies and the hardest ones that we have. And Unfortunately, on this particular graph, a lot of them are really difficult and inefficient, but I, once again, we'll be able to lay over how much we've automated that process and how they're not doing some of these things every day, and it's not as difficult as it used to be. Then below that are the opportunities we saw. So basically, uh, this is capturing all the things that we want to include in our project that we see for these particular users. We saw a lot of need for, um, for them specifically. A lot of them talked about how they wanted to see vehicle information and they wanted to see customer information in the same place. So we pulled that out and put that as an opportunity so that when we were designing for things, we could make sure that uh, that information and that was captured and that we would design appropriately for that. So these are all the opportunities for the organization and for us as designers and developers to be able to capture. So just to sum it all up, this, this journey map helps us understand what the project is, where our goals are, what our users are doing, what they're thinking, and what are some of the opportunities we have to create enhancements for them. And then the next thing I want to talk about is story mapping. And what I like about this, I like to do this at the end of our discovery phase, because it's basically we've spent some time talking about the vision, talking about the project, talking about our users, and then I will start wanting to get more concrete about understanding what it is that we're building. And this particular exercise is, uh, I like the quote of, it's a user story I can understand. Because a lot of times I'll get a spreadsheet of user stories and they'll be like, okay, now you understand what we need to build. And I'll be like, I don't understand this at all. <laughs> so one thing I like about story mapping is it'll, it's a way for us to have a conversation and we frame it in, in the way of what are the jobs and tasks people have to do. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll have this blue bar. This is an example of a digital version of a story map we did. So the blue above should have been the jobs that we had uh, talked about and then the tasks below that they had to do, um, like the login, the profile, all the things they had to do to create certain things. Um, this actually, you could expand it on the, on the website and they'd have additional tasks underneath that to be able to, basically there's a little subtask to be able to understand all the micro stories underneath that. So 
Basically, this helps us talk about how our user stories are for the whole application, what people have to get done, and what are the steps they have to do to get that done. And we're able to all have a conversation about it. It's not just developers being able to write these stories, but our stakeholders can get involved, designers can get involved. And then once we have that created, we can document this digitally, and this starts giving our designers ideas for how to create the site map. They start understanding how many screens we're going to have, where this information is supposed to go, what's similar information that we can put in the same place. And then it also helps our developers start writing out those user stories and understanding, have a shared understanding of what this means. Because if we just read a bunch of Excel docs, we don't always have an understanding of what it is we're building and why we're building it. But user story, story mapping is a way for us to have a conversation about it and make sure we have shared understanding of what we're building and why. And then the other thing you can do once you have this all lined out is you can actually take tape and you can section out the different sprints you're going to have and use it as a way to, to sprint plan based on getting these things done first and then the next thing and the next thing. So I'll go through this really quickly. But once you have done all this research to understand and inform your design and start building stuff, I think it's really important to test your assumptions. Even though you did initial resource research and you've, you've talked to a lot of different people, you still want to make sure you guys are on the right track of understanding how you're creating value. And there's two ways you can do this that I find really effective. And I find them super effective if you can do them together. And one is by using growth hacking practices. If you guys aren't familiar with growth hacking, a growth hacker is usually uh, part marketer, part front encoder, part uh, even like hacker. And they, they're all put together in order to be able to run a lot of experiments and data, run A-B tests, and be able to read that information and see if I change words here, if I change a picture, does that help people you know, convert better? Does that help them click on, find things that they need? Does that communicate to them? Um, one of the best examples of this is when we first designed Robin, we thought, uh, well, most of our, um, most of our, the people that we're designing for are moms, and they have kids, everybody loves kids, we'll put on our hero image a kid running through the lawn with a sprinkler, and our tagline will be 21st century lawn care, because that's like the future, and this is great, let's put it out, let's get it out there. And then our growth hacker came back, and he ran some experiments, and what he found out was, People actually didn't care about seeing that kid and seeing the dog run through the sprinkler. What they really wanted to see was just a nice lawn. That by them understanding that this was a nice lawn taken care of, they understood what this product was and how they converted better with that. And he also uh, tinkered with the phrase 21st century lawn care. And we found that, that what was most effective for people to understand what this business was, was the phrase, put your lawn on autopilot. So we were able to understand some of the things um, that was communicated really well to people. We were able to change our design based on his findings, and we created a new landing page with some other changes that he had recommended, and we got a lot. We basically, it was over 200% conversion rate enhancement for doing these particular changes. So he can look at the data. Basically, um, everybody can be involved with saying, I think this will work if we do it this way, and this is how impactful I think it'll be, then he'll basically rate all the different uh, experiments, he'll put them through a pipeline and he'll start testing them. The idea is you run a couple experiments a week to see if they worked. If it comes back it worked, he'll look at, he'll give an explanation about why he thinks it works, he'll look at the data, and then if you get enough information about, um, you can either do this as iterative ha enhancements, you can also do it as a way of testing your assumptions of if I think this product works because they'll use this online portal and this book companion and you need to make sure people really uh, want to use this online companion, you can have him run a couple experiments to test that hypothesis and if it works then great, let's keep moving. If it, if it proves out that it doesn't work then maybe you should pivot your idea and your product and find out what people really, really want to use it as. So he's great for, or she, is great for using uh, information and data to test ideas. And the other thing I think you guys are mostly familiar with is using user testing. And it's, it's great to have data so to support your ideas, but it's also really important to understand why. And he can't ask people why they do what they do or what they think. He's just coming up with hypothesis about why he thinks that behavior is happening. And so with user testing, you can use it as a nice companion to actually get five people in a room 
ask them what they think, ask them how they use it, and you'll start understanding the, the why behind people's behavior. And you'll also see what are some of the things that are missing in your application that would make it better with your usability testing. And so um, that is something really crucial to helping understand your assumptions is growth hacking and user testing. So then the summary of why I think research is so important. We're all familiar with Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat. Um, we could all have a client or a product owner come to us and say, I need you to build an application. It needs to be able to take pictures, have filters, and share it with other people. Go and build it. And if we don't take the time to make sure that we understand who we're building for and what their needs and use cases are, we might be building the wrong application for the wrong user. It may be a perfectly good application, and it may be the best application we've built, but if it's not intended to create value for the people that we need it to, then that uh, can basically really hurt our business. Like Snapchat is really all about inventing yourself that day. I don't have a history of my pictures, I don't have a profile, and I'm sharing personally who I am individually with my friends and close colleagues. And so it's a very um, different way of interacting than Facebook where uh, everybody's on Facebook and I want to share the whole event and I'll just put it on there because grandma wants to see the baby and see what everybody's up to. So I'll go ahead and, and dump everything on there. Versus the use case of Instagram is I might be sick of all the political comments on Facebook and I just want to see people's pictures. I don't want to read anything. Just show me the, the culmination of the nice event. And so it's really important for us to be able to do the research and understand who we're designing for so that we can build Snapchat for the Snapchat users and not for grandma. So anyway, do you guys have any questions? That concludes this talk. <laughs>